All right, good morning, everybody. And I hope you've had a good week. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to be able to teach the Word of God. And I'm grateful for the technology that enables me to be able to continue to teach the Word of God at this time of uh, transition in my own life uh, from uh, moving from Portland to Boise and just the whole transition involved with that. So I'm glad to be able to continue to teach these Bible studies, and I hope that they're a blessing to you, and I hope you're learning some things. So over the last uh, number of weeks, I've been explaining to you this template uh, that can be applied to multiple areas of life, uh, multiple areas of the universe even, and multiple areas of reality. As we study these things, I think you'll see that this template fits in many different ways and is a template really that is ordained of the Lord as far as how he has certain things set up in our spiritual and physical reality. And uh, these three aspects to the template that I've showed you are the vertical, the horizontal, and the inverted. Um, obviously, these th three words don't show up in the Bible, per se, uh, but honestly, trying to communicate this concept, that is the best, the best wording that I could come up with in order to try to communicate what's there. Uh, and maybe it's just for lack of better terms. If you have a better way to describe what I'm trying to get across, then by all means, let me know. But as far as I can tell, hor uh, vertical, horizontal, and inverted seems to fit and be consistent uh, pretty well. So the vertical, as you know, pertains to God, pertains to heaven, pertains to Jesus, the scriptures, the Holy Ghost. It has to do with perfection. Uh, the horizontal pertains to man, mankind, humanity, the earth, and uh, this is an area of imperfection. And uh, the inverted pertains to Satan, hell, uh, sin and wickedness, and uh, things along those lines. And what you'd have is the vertical is obviously best uh, the horizontal can be good, but there is a mixture of good and bad in the horizontal. And then the inverted is just completely evil. All right, so <clears throat> the most uh, significant contribution of this template in your life, I believe, is that it's going to help you maintain a proper balance in your perceptions of, as a Christian, your perceptions of the world around you, uh, your per, your uh, understanding of Bible doctrine. Um, it's going to help you ba be balanced in your attitudes uh, towards things around you and towards people around you and events around you. And it'll help you to be balanced in your actions as a Christian. And the key statement that I want to emphasize over and over in these lessons is, if you eliminate the horizontal, in an attempt to be devoted solely to the vertical, you will inadvertently become inverted. All right. Now, it's a noble thing to want to be solely devoted to the vertical, but the thing is, God has created this whole thing as a balance for us. And uh, you don't want to eliminate something that God has ordained. You don't want to eliminate something that God hasn't eliminated, right? God hasn't eliminated the horizontal. He can still acknowledge it in its proper context in certain ways. Uh, and you want to be able to do the same thing. Obviously, as Christians, we make the vertical the most important, but you don't want to eliminate the horizontal in an attempt to be solely devoted to the vertical, because if you do, you will inadvertently become inverted. And uh, we see that over and over, and I'm going to continue to point that out. And hopefully you've uh, probably seen that in your own life. I mean, really, the things that I'm communicating are probably things that you already know. But what this series of lessons does is it helps you to separate things that maybe before kind of blurred together and you weren't really sure which way to look at things. And so by having this template, it's really helping to separate things in your mind, be able to put things in their proper context and be able to, like the Bible says, rightly divide the word of truth, all right? So, our, uh, like I said, our emphasis and focus should be on the vertical, yes, but as Christians, we must be careful to try not to eliminate the horizontal from our thinking. Uh, the horizontal does have its problems and its potential pitfalls. Nevertheless, its existence, like I said, is according to the will of God, and, so it's certain, and God has it there to help keep you balanced as a Christian in this world. Now, uh, if you've listened to the previous lessons, uh, you know what I mean by that, and I'll explain more of that as we go. But uh, this is part five in these series of lessons, and I'm going to start applying this template in the subject of governments and citizenship. And uh, in order to go in the proper order that'll probably make the most sense, I'm going to start with citizenship today. And that word citizen appears four times in the Bible, and it simply means an inhabitant of a city or a member of a country. Now, if you'll turn to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, and in verse 19, <clears throat> the Bible says, 
speaking uh, of us Christians, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. And with and of the household of God. So as Christians, you know, we belong to God's family and we are citizens of heaven spiritually, even though none of us have actually ever been to heaven, you know, physically, uh, you know, the place of our citizenship. Basically, I'm a citizen of heaven, even though I've never actually been there before. Um, the, I mean, at least I certainly don't think I have. <laughs> I mean, uh, and not even when my head slammed against the concrete a few months back. Um, unfortunately, I was not, uh, you know, caught up into paradise, and I did not hear unspeakable words, which is a, which, is, which it is unlawful for a man to utter. Uh, that was not my experience, at least uh, from what I can remember. Okay, now, uh, and for the most part, I'm sure that that's true of you as well, the listener. None of us have ever been to heaven physically, yet because of our spiritual oneness with Christ, our, our unity with Him, our, jo- our being joined together with Him spiritually, there is a sense in which we are right now in heaven, seated with Him in heavenly places in Christ, like it says there in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. So in a sense, I am already in heaven, but that's a spiritual thing, and it has to do with my uh, being one with the whole with the Holy Spirit, you know, He that is joined unto the Lord is one Spirit, and all that. All right, so uh, we are truly uh, going. Uh, even though I'm not a physical citizen of heaven right now, um, God counts me as a citizen of heaven because my spiritual citizenship is there. All right, I think that makes sense. It's a spiritual citizenship. So prior to my salvation, I was not a spiritual citizen of heaven. I was a stranger to heaven. I was a foreigner to heaven, to that country, spiritually. I was an alien, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Look at that verse right there. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, it says that at that time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. So that described me prior to my salvation, and that described you prior to prior to your salvation. All right. So uh, God did not consider me at that time prior to my salvation. God did not consider me a dreamer or an asylum seeker or an undocumented citizen. No, it was stranger, foreigner, alien. Okay. And the Holy Spirit wasn't worried about offending me with his discriminatory offensive language. All right. Those, that's the Bible terminology for it. Now, spiritually, before I was saved and before you were saved, we were citizens of hell prior to our salvation. And the devil was our father. And, uh, you know, the same, like I said, the same was true of me before I got saved. The same is true of you before you got saved. And if you're watching and you're not saved, the same is true of you right now. Spiritually, you are a citizen of hell and the devil is your father. And as citizens, uh, and basically every person on the planet is a citizen spiritually of either heaven or hell. Okay. It's one or the other. And as Christians, as citizens of heaven, you know, we should set our affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And we should not lay up for ourselves treasures upon earth, but lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven where, uh, because, you know, for where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. So as citizens of heaven, you know, we should have our focus on the vertical. We should have our focus on heaven, okay? And as citizens of heaven, we should love our heavenly country. And we should long for our heavenly country. And we should be loyal to our heavenly country, right? And our attitude should be like the attitude of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose situation paralleled our situation in some ways. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm careful to phrase it that way. And I'll explain why in here in just a minute. <clears throat> their situation, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was a physical situation. And their physical situation back then parallels our spiritual situation in many ways. Hebrews 11, chapter 13, it says, These all, the context being Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob specifically, died in faith, not having received the promises. The context here is the promise of a little, literal land grant inheritance in the land of Canaan. All right, they, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob didn't receive those promises. Okay, uh, they didn't get them at that time. They were given the promise. They were told they were promised something, but they didn't get it within their lifetime. All right, 
uh, but their seed is going to, and they are going to get it someday. All right. They having not received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were what strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They were literally strangers and pilgrims. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob literally were not citizens of any particular country and literally traveled around like nomads or gypsies, you know. Uh, and that's an important detail, like I said, that we'll come back to in a minute. But in verse 14, it says, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, which would have been Ur of the Chaldees, the Babylonian era, area in the context, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. And then it says in verse 16, But now they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. All right, now certainly there's a lot there that we can spiritually apply to ourselves as Christians, okay? What was true for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob physically is true for us New Testament Christians spiritually. We should not be mindful of the country from which we came out. But let me pause there, and let me just ask this question. What country is that? <laughs> right? At the time when I got saved, I was around 13 years old, I was a citizen of the United States of America, specifically Boise, Idaho. All right, so let me ask this question. Now that I'm saved, am I not to be mindful of the USA, the country? That was my, that was my citizenship. Am I not to be mindful of the country from which I came out, the USA, Boise, Idaho? <clears throat> well, here's where we need to slow down and proceed with caution. You know, we got the flashing yellow lights here in the scripture, and we need to not go blasting through here. Otherwise, uh, we're going to make some mistakes. Before I was saved, I had dual citizenship, and so did you. Spiritually, I was a citizen of hell. Physically, I was a citizen of the United States of America. Okay? Me personally. When I got saved, spiritually, I became a citizen of heaven... But guess what? Physically, I was still a citizen of the United States of America. Shocker. <laughs> you know, right? Physically, my country did not change. But spiritually, my country did change. Right? So when the Bible indicates that I should not be mindful of the country from whence I came out... Is that saying that I should not be mindful of the United States of America? Or is that saying that I should not be mindful of hell and of the kingdom of sinful darkness from which I was a previous uh, citizen of? Which one is it? Is it referring to my physical citizenship or is it referring to my spiritual citizenship? Well, here's the thing. When I got saved, I never came out of America. And if you were an American citizen when you got saved, you didn't either. And that, the same is true of whatever country you are part of. If you were a Russian when you got saved, if you lived in Russia and were a citizen of Russia, when you got saved, physically, you were still a citizen of Russia. Your spiritual, or I mean your physical citizenship did not change. When I got saved, I never came out of America. If I never, and if I never came out of America, how can I be mindful of returning to a country from which I never came out of in the first place. You see what I'm saying? Now, I know that's obvious when it's said, yet how many times have you heard this passage here in, in Hebrews chapter 11 preached and interpreted to mean that since we are Christians, we therefore are citizens of heaven and we have no business having any involvement in the things that pertain to local, state, or national government? How many times have you heard that? I know I've heard that plenty of times growing up in Bible-believing circles. That's uh, pretty much the circle I've been in for most of my life. Okay, The, 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 the preaching or, or the attitude or the mentality kind of goes like this. You're citizens of heaven now, so why are you wasting your time going to local school board meetings? 
Why are you wasting your time going to city council meetings? <clears throat> As a born-again Christian, why are you going to peaceful political demonstrations? Why would you waste your time with that? Right? And uh, this is often the position of uh, what you might call the hardcore Bible believer. And honestly, I myself have even thought along those lines in times past. I mean, some guys even go so far as to say, you're citizens of heaven, so why are you wasting your time voting in local, state, and or national elections? If you were a real Bible believer, you wouldn't waste your time with that. Now, how many times have you heard that preached over a pulpit? <coughs> or published somewhere? If you were a real Bible believer, you wouldn't waste your time voting in state, local, or national elections, because you as a Christian have no business dealing with any of that. Now, I know you've heard that if you're a Bible believer. Just be honest, okay? We've heard that. But what is going on here? Well, I reckon that it might be possible that we are misapplying the Scripture. <laughs> Perhaps we have eliminated horizontal citizenship in an attempt to be solely diver devoted to physical, or I mean, a, a vertical citizenship, and thereby have inadvertently become inverted in our thinking. Think about that for a second while I try to clear my throat. <coughs> now listen. For the record, I am not against Bible believers. I myself am a King James Bible believer. All right, but I think that uh, I'm in a position at least to be able to identify. I mean, I've, I've been in this circle for 20 years. I've been preaching for 20 years. I've been a King James Bible believer for over 20 years. I've been saved for over 20 years. I've been doing this for a long time. All right, I'm almost 40 years old. I don't consider myself a pro by no means, but I feel like I'm at the point where I've been around the block a few times and I now have uh, the right to be able to comment on some things. I'll leave that to you to decide whether that's whether you agree with that or not. But regardless, I believe and I perceive that we have a Bible blind spot uh, in this particular area as King James Bible believers. And in my experience, usually it is the King James Bible believers who advance the notion that voting is something that a Christian should not be meddling with. And involvement in politics and government is, a, is something that a Christian should not be meddling with because that is being mindful of our previous country. Right? That's usually the, the justification for that thinking. But hold on. America is not my previous country. America is my current country and has been my whole life. And America is and always has been my physical country of citizenship. Spiritually, hell, sin, and death was my previous country. And spiritually, heaven is my current country, and thank God, always will be. But notice how the anti-America, anti-patriotic preaching is accomplished by conflating or mashing together spiritual citizenship with physical citizenship. You try to put those two things together, and you end up uh, getting error in your doctrine. And is not that how most error in doctrine happens, by conflating or smashing together two things that should be viewed separately? That's exactly how a lot of false doctrine gets taught. By putting by two things, by not rightly dividing things and smashing them together, that's how a lot of false doctrine and bad teaching and erroneous preaching takes place. <clears throat> We're supposed to rightly divide the word of truth. And when you don't, it causes doctrinal errors and errors in attitude and errors in mentality. And I think that's what's happened here. Perhaps what we need to do is rightly divide physical citizenship from spiritual citizenship and not eliminate one in an attempt to be devoted solely to the other. Because here's the thing. You as a saved KJV Bible-believing Christian are still a citizen in your community, city, and country. And there are real, legitimate issues that regularly come up that have a real, legitimate effect on you, your family, and the people around you in your community. Um, <clears throat> and citizens are ultimately responsible uh, for their own city and country, right? And since you are a citizen of America, you still bear some responsibility for what happens in the locale in which you live, okay? But many Bible believers have the attitude and mentality that they are not 
citizens of America, and they are strangers, foreigners, and pilgrims in America. And so therefore, whatever happens in this country is not my problem, right? Oh, you'll still collect your social security, you know, and you'll still take any government uh, discounts or benefits that are extended to you. And you're a citizen of this country when it benefits you, but you're all of a sudden not a citizen when it means you having to actually do something that might benefit your community, but might inconvenience yourself. <laughs> you see how that works? You see, the Bible believer who thinks that because he has heavenly citizenship, therefore he bears no responsibility or accountability in regards to his earthly citizenship, he has now become dead weight to those around him who are trying to responsibly manage the community in which they live. You see, in every society, there are always irresponsible people who are trying to get into power and they do so so that they can be rich and influential and rule over, over others and affect the change that they want. In every society, you're going to have those irresponsible people. And those irresponsible members of society continually drag their society downward into moral decay. And responsible members of society, and I'm not talking about saved or lost, I'm just talking about it within this horizontal context, Responsible members of society seek for right judgment and justice and through right actions and right decisions, in other words, horizontal rightness, horizontal righteousness, they lift society upwards towards the highway of the upright, as the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 17. I'm not equating unsaved people doing good things in their society with vertical righteousness. That's something completely separate. I'm talking about in this context, there is such thing as righteousness exalteth a nation. And when God said that, he wasn't talking about uh, salvation. He wasn't talking about the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He was talking about people who do right and adhere to the right moral laws of God. That will exalt a nation whether that nation is saved or lost. Regardless of who the God of that nation is, if a, if a nation will adhere to the moral commandments of God and punish iniquity, you know, and punish uh, uh, crime and transgression, hey, by according to the laws of sowing and reaping, that will exalt that country. But when a country starts giving into corruption and wickedness and sin and all this other stuff, it degrades a country. It's just according to the laws of sowing and reaping. All right. So when you have responsible members of society who are trying to do right and want right laws and want uh, right decisions being made in their uh, places of power, okay, they lift society upwards, and these responsible members of society, like I said, may not even be Christians. They just have a conscience, and they know the difference between right and wrong, okay? And they want what's best for their community, and they understand that righteousness exalteth their community, right? And so that's what they want, whether they understand or have ever read that verse or not. There's an instinctiveness in, in human nature that understands if you do right, things will work out good, and if you do wrong, things will go bad. Right, and then that can get all twisted. But anyway, uh, there's a continual tug of war of right and wrong that happens in every society. All right, the the right are always trying to pull things in the right direction. And I'm not talking about saved or lost. I'm just talking about people who want the right thing done in their community. And then there's wicked people who are selfish and they want evil. They love evil. They love wickedness. The Bible describes those kinds of people. And they're pulling this way. And there's this continual tug of war. And when a person gets saved, okay, and becomes convinced that his earthly citizenship has been exchanged for a heavenly citizenship, what happens is, and he eliminates his earthly citizenship in his mind in an attempt to be devoted solely to his vertical citizenship, what happens is he tends to drop the rope of his earthly citizenship responsibilities, which makes it harder for the good people, uh, try, for, for good people trying to succeed and easier for the evil people to succeed. Okay, the Christian has just dropped the rope. <laughs> it's not my problem anymore. You deal with it. And so that's one less good person pulling on the rope and evil gets a little bit more of a foothold, right? You know? So what happens with this uh, guy who thinks that just because he's a citizen of heaven, he doesn't bear any responsibility in his citizenship on earth? Well, don't worry. You know, he'll stand aside and he'll preach at everybody trying to stem the tide of evil in society. Uh, but uh, he, when it comes to actually helping out or doing anything, uh, nope. You know, he, you're wasting your time because it's all going to burn anyway. 
<laughs> right? You're just wasting your time trying to make a difference in society. Uh, it's all going to burn. And you know what? All the pedophiles, all the globalists, all the fascists, and all the communists on the other side of the rope shout, Amen! Preach it! Park there a while, Mr. Bible Believer. Right? You're a vertical citizen... Who, you're a vertical citizen who has eliminated his horizontal citizenship and has become inverted in his thinking, and you're contributing really to the destruction of your country by not trying to have any kind of participation or, or help your community. You've completely forsaken the horizontal, and in a lot of ways, you're playing right into the hand of the communists, fascists, and pedophiles, and Satanists who want to overthrow this country. Because they don't want anybody standing against them, and by you removing yourself from the equation, you're just one less person they have to deal with. Part of the reason why nations in the past have uh, come out of darkness and have overcome the inverted people in their society was because Christians took a stand against them, <laughs> even though and they preached the gospel, but they also stood against the wicked people in their community society, and societies and nations. They stood against them, right? History bears witness to that. All right? So the problem is the, the Christian that's become so vertical that he's eliminated the horizontal in his mind, he, he actually is indirectly helping evil advance in his society. Let me explain. Listen, pedophiles are infiltrating the public schools with their perversion. And if you don't believe me, check out manifestnews.net and see for yourself. I put some videos on there in regards to some of this stuff that's going on in the public schools. There's a few videos on there that uh, some of the books in the public schools, people got up at their parent-teacher conferences and read from the book that's being taught to their children, and their mics were muted because what they were reading was too offensive and vulgar for the mixed audience. And yet when the parent tried to explain, yeah, but you're reading this to children in the classrooms, they wouldn't listen to the parents. And some of the stuff on those videos is just so vulgar and so vile, I didn't, I didn't feel right about even putting it on Manifest News. Just Google it. Look it up. Look it up on YouTube. And the parents uh, reading from the uh, curriculums of these LGBTQ pedophiles. It, it's revolting. It's disgusting. But that stuff is coming into the public schools. Now, let me ask you, where are the King James Bible believers? Stand, where are they standing against it? Where are they? Are they standing against it? I'm sure some are, thank God. But I certainly not. it doesn't seem like a majority are even uh, dabbling or even messing with that. All right, how about this? Transvestite drag queens are reading stories to children. Where are the KJV Bible believers standing against that? Right? I don't say where are the Christians standing against it, because many Christians are standing against it, but often you find that the Christians that are countering and fighting against this LGBT drag queen story time, the pedophiles coming into school, and a lot of these societal wickedness issues, the Christians that are taking the biggest stand against that, I find, are usually the evangelical Christians, the contemporary Christian music Christians, the NIV, NASB, and uh, new KJV, and even ESB-toting Christians, certainly non-dispensationalist Christians are taking a stand against it. But where are the King James Version Bible-believing Christians taking a stand against this stuff? And I know there's a few of them out there, and I praise God for them. But uh, here's the thing. He said, I say, where are they? Oh, I know where they are. I know what they're thinking. It's not your problem, right? It's all going to burn anyway. So why get involved, right? Satan is the god of this world, so what's the point, right? Evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, so therefore any attempt to stop the advance of evil in society is actually opposing the will of God, right? Have you heard that before? How about this? Well, all of the nations are going to be delivered to the Antichrist, so therefore, voting for someone who wants to, to go in the right direction is basically opposing God. Right? Mm-hmm. Raise your hand if you've heard that before from King James Bible-believing preachers. Now, listen, if I've said that before, I apologize, that was retarded, okay? 
I don't think I've ever gone that far with it, but in the last 20 years of preaching, I do know that I've said some stupid things. All right, so I don't think I've said that, but if somebody finds a video or a sermon that I preach and I said something like that, I apologize, okay? That's retarded. Uh, you know, here's the thing. Part of the reason why I can, I can acknowledge and, and understand this is because I've been there before. I've been the guy that wanted to be so spiritual that he eliminated the horizontal in an attempt to be vertical and, be, and was inverted in my thinking. I've been there. Okay, I can admit it. How about you? Can you admit it? Can you recognize it when it's around you? All right? It's important not to eliminate this because you end up becoming inverted in your thinking. And so, stinking backwards, you know, so these, these inverted mentalities, they're inverted mentalities that are harbored by those who think they are being spiritual for thinking that way, but the other unsaved, responsible citizens in your community are wondering what the heck your problem is as a Bible-believing Christian. <laughs> Listen, when you got saved, your spiritual citizenship changed, but your physical citizenship didn't. And consequently, you bear the same responsibility as a citizen in your community after you got saved as you did before you got saved. And in some ways, it could be argued that you actually have more responsibility as a saved citizen in your community than you did when you were an unsaved citizen in your community. You understand? If you need to pause that and rewind that and listen to that again, do so. <laughs> okay? You do indeed bear dual citizenship. You are a vertical, spiritual citizen of heaven, and you are a horizontal, physical citizen of America, or whatever country you live in, and you have responsibilities to both countries. You have responsibilities to both because you're a citizen of both. You see? You can't just say, well, I only have responsibility to the vertical... And that's all. No, when you start talking that way, you've eliminated one. You've eliminated a legitimate responsibility that you have. And you're becoming inverted in your thinking. Let me ask you this. What if I preached that because you are now of the heavenly household of God, your responsibility is to your brothers and sisters in Christ now, and you no longer have any responsibility to your earthly household because you are part of the heavenly household of God now that you're saved. So you don't bear any responsibility in your, in your earthly household. No, no, no. Would I be super spiritual or sold out to God for talking that way? What if my earthly house, what if I was the only person saved in my family and my wife and my kids were all lost and I'm part of a heavenly household and I said, well, you know, I'm not a part of this earthly household anymore. Bye bye. Would I be super spiritual and sold out for God for thinking that way? Or would I be twisted in my thinking? Would you not agree that by me eliminating my horizontal household in an attempt to be devoted solely to my vertical household, I had inadvertently become inverted in my thinking? Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> well, the same is true in regards to your responsibilities as a citizen. To say that because your citizenship is in heaven, you therefore bear no responsibility to your earthly citizenship, you have in essence eliminated your horizontal citizenship in an attempt to be devoted solely to your vertical citizenship and have an invert, inadvertently become inverted in your thinking. And, your thi and the way you behave is similar to the behavior of other inverted people. Not, not exactly the same. I don't, I don't expect anybody to be throwing Molotov cocktails and all that. But the thing is, you are inverted in your thinking. And you're actually antagonistic to the people that are trying to do the right thing. <laughs> Just like the enemy is antagonistic to those trying to do the right thing. Now listen, I know that you mean well, but your thinking is messed up because you are not rightly dividing the word of truth in these matters. And that's why I ex I've been explaining this template is is extremely important. I mean, we would say dispensations and rightly dividing the word of truth is is important in terms of dispensations, right? I'm not going to say one is more important than the other. I don't, I'm not, I don't even know. But this is another one of those templates that is critical to your understanding of the scriptures. You, If you get a hold of this, 
it'd be like you getting a hold of uh, Larkin's dispensational charts. I mean, it just opens up so many things to you and gives you an understanding and helps you put scriptures in the right place. Now, like I said, I'm not comparing myself to Clarence Larkin. I'm not saying, I'm just saying this is another important area of rightly dividing the word of truth that you need to get. Because if you don't understand these divisions, you're going to mash things together and get a lot of your thinking wrong. Now, as I've said before, and I'll say it again, the vertical is the most important and should be your primary focus as a Christian. But just because your vertical citizenship and responsibility is the most important responsibility doesn't mean that your horizontal citizenship and responsibility has ceased to exist. Okay? I've been in Bible-believing circles, like I said, most of my Christian life. And somewhere, the KJV Bible believers have really dropped the ball in this area, at least in my opinion. Now, again, I'll, I'll leave that to you to determine if you agree with that or not. But somewhere along the line, I think the thinking got messed up. And somewhere along the line, we took the scriptures that had a spiritual application, right? Like Hebrews 11. And we applied them physically to our physical citizenship. Okay? And what is that? Well... We did the very thing that we condemn other Christian groups for doing. <laughs> we misinterpreted something in the scripture that was meant to be spiritual, and we, we made it physical. The Catholic Church does that all the time. Now listen, it's better to admit an error than to live in arrogant denial. Okay? We need to rethink some of the mentalities that some of us have latched on to. Okay? Listen, I am not saying that every Christian needs to go out and run for office, and we Christians, you know, need to take over the government, we need to save America, okay? I know that there's Christians that go to that extreme, right? We shouldn't be going to extremes, okay? Listen, uh, the idea that we need to save America because we're Christians, that, uh, that's, that's acknowledging the horizontal, and that's good. But the problem with a lot of that type of preaching and that kind of thinking is what they've done is they've put the horizontal above the vertical, like that. And that's, that kind of thinking is just as wrong. A lot of times this is what you get in the fundamentalist uh, circles. They acknowledge the vertical, yes, and they acknowledge the horizontal, but they make a mistake sometimes as to putting the horizontal and your earthly citizenship as an American is more important than this. And they spend their whole lives endeavoring trying to get into Congress and get into the White House and take over the country so that we can have a righteous nation and blah, blah, blah. And they end up putting the horizontal more important than the vertical. That's wrong, too. But it's also wrong for KJV Bible believers to say, well, because we don't agree with that, we're just going to throw out the horizontal and just focus on the vertical. Well, now you're inverted, too. All right. So you got to have these things in the right in the right perspectives, in the right contexts. All right. Let's not be careful to gravitate to extremes on one side or the other. It's not our responsibility to take over America and save America, right? But it's also not our responsibility to neglect our country either, okay? It's not our job to win the world for democracy. It's our job to win the world for Christ, okay? But that doesn't relieve us of our responsibility and accountability as citizens in which we live. Listen, you can be, heaven, you can be a heavenly-minded Christian. Think about this. You can be a heavenly-minded Christian and still be a good employee in your company and actively participate in that, country, in that company's prosperity and advancement, you ought to be the, the best com uh, employee in your company if you're a Bible-believing Christian. And that goes back to now that you're saved, you almost have more of a responsibility to be a better employee than the unsaved uh, employees around you. But the same type of thing applies when it comes to your country. Um, you can be a heavenly-minded Christian and still be a good citizen for your country and actively participate in your country's prosperity and advancement, and that doesn't make you a traitor to your heavenly country for doing so. You're simply acknowledging your responsibilities to both and fulfilling your responsibilities to both. Think about this. Back in the Old Testament, there were a group of people who were physically removed from their country and physically inserted into another country. And the country that they were put into was actually the very country that destroyed their country, <laughs> right? Babylon. Uh, if anyone had a reason to not get involved in their community, 
It was the Jews in Babylon. <laughs> okay? If anyone could make a biblical argument as to not being a participant or helper in their community, it was the Jews in Gentile Babylon. The Jews were God's people in Marduk's land. Why would they want to help Babylon in any way? <clears throat> If anyone had an, could have an excuse to just sit around and worship and serve the true God and have zero involvement in their heathen society, it was the Jews in Babylon. They had way more justification for that than you do as a New Testament Christian. And yet, look what God said to them. Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29, verse 4. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have carried, caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Okay? So I'm speaking to the captives in Babylon. Build ye houses, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives, and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there, and not diminished. And then he says this, And seek the peace of the city, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof ye shall have peace. Okay? Now again, I'm not advocate. I am not, do not put words in my mouth, I am not advocating that every born-again Christian needs to go out and run for office. But I'm also not going to oppose a Christian, I'm not going to oppose a Christian who decides to do so. Okay? I used to be a little bit more antagonistic towards that kind of thing. But listen, the way you think the Lord is leading you is between you and the Lord, okay? And knowing the Lord, and knowing the diversity of His workings, why would I assume that God would never direct a Christian into some sort of public office? Now, He may not be directing me into public office, but why would I assume that God would never direct any other Christian into public office, whether it's local, national, or... Uh, uh, city, you know, or anything like that. See, you've got to be careful about putting God into your little box of your own making. Whether a Christian is right or wrong for going into a place of public office is not my decision one way or the other. And doing so is not a sin if the Lord wants them to do that. They have liberty in Christ, and if God is leading them that way, that's then fine. Okay? And that's between them and God, and they'll be accountable to God for what they do, just as I'll be accountable to God for what I do, right? And if the Lord is telling them to run for office, then that's what they need to do, regardless of what any other Christian thinks of them. And maybe I'm speaking to somebody here who's been uh, discouraged from running in, running in public office, but maybe in your heart you know that's what God wants you to do. Maybe you know in your heart that God wants you to be on a school board. Maybe you know in your heart that God wants you to run for city council or city mayor. Maybe in your heart you know that God wants you to run for Congress. You say, it's impossible. Why would that be impossible? If God's telling you to do that, Christian, you need to do that, regardless of what anybody else thinks of it. And you'll probably catch a lot of flack <laughs> from the King James Bible believers, but that's okay. Right? Do what God wants you to do. Okay? And if they do run for office, great. I'm glad that there's going to be somebody who hopefully will take a stand for right things and not get blackmailed and messed up while they're in there. <laughs> right? But uh, standing up for rightness is a good thing. Okay? And uh, listen, if a, Daniel, if a Daniel is running for office, I'll vote for him. And I'm not a traitor to heaven for exercising my responsibilities as a citizen of Earth, on earth in America. Um, I haven't turned my focus to the things of the world by taking 30 minutes out of my time to fill out a voter pamphlet. Um, if a Joseph is running for office, I'll vote for him. 
Some Bible-believing Christians are so inverted in their thinking that they think that voting for the worst possible candidate is what Christians should do, so that way when the country falls apart, people will repent and get right with God. What makes you so sure that's going to happen? What if a national disaster re didn't result in revival, but resulted in weak Christians falling away from the faith? Are you sure that your country descending into total anarchy is going to bring about revival? Maybe you should think about that a little bit more, because that doesn't always happen. Or better yet, I've heard it said along these lines, let's vote for the worst guy, so maybe we could all get murdered. Oh, how spiritual that sounds. Except it isn't. <laughs> that is unnatural, inverted thinking. Sometimes, now listen, sometimes mentalities that are contrary to your human nature are spiritual. For example, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. That is against what your physical fleshly nature craves, okay? Taking up a cross. Sometimes doing a thing that's contrary to nature is spiritual and of the Lord. But sometimes... You also have to remember, sometimes mentalities that are contrary to your nature are demonic and spiritual that way. They can be on either side of the spiritual spectrum. So be careful with, <clears throat> with the thinking that just because something is against your natural inclination, that therefore it's automatically of God. A lot of people uh, whip themselves and they nail themselves to crosses and they do all kinds of things that are you know, against their flesh, you know, they just want to crucify their flesh. And they do all kinds of things that are very unnatural. And they think they're spiritual, but the spiritual part, the, 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 the spiritual aspect to what they're doing is demonic. Just because it's against your nature doesn't mean that it's of God. You got to pay attention to that. Listen, wishing for your country's destruction so that you can hopefully get martyred is not being spiritual. That's not the deeper Christian life, friend. That's an attempt to be so devoted to the vertical that you've inadvertently become inverted in your thinking. How about this? Hey, if Osiris is running for office, I'll vote for him. Right? He's not even a brother. That's not me. Listen, that's not me setting my affection. Okay, so Osiris in this illustration is an unsaved person that, that is a good man, that's, that does the right thing, that makes the right decisions, that advances righteousness and puts down wickedness. Okay, that was Cyrus in the Bible. He wasn't a great person. You read about his life as a person in his, history. He had a lot of problems, but Cyrus did, made some good decisions regardless of his personal life. Okay, he made the right decisions. He was an unsaved man. Hey, if Osiris is running for office, I'll vote for him. And that's not me setting my affection on a beast nation. Just because I'm a physical citizen of a beast nation, and America, by the way, is a beast nation, uh, that doesn't mean that my job as a KJV Bible to believer is to hope for my beast nation's death any more than Daniel or Mordecai was to hope for the death of the Persia beast nation. Jesus will deal with my USA beast nation in his time. My USA beast nation is his problem, not my problem. He'll deal with it. My USA beast nation won't get away with any of the sin that it's responsible for. And my USA beast nation will eventually turn against Israel. I know that. If you're a Bible believer, you know that too. But listen, think about this. Babylon, like the maybe worst nation, the most antagonistic nation to God in the Bible, <laughs> Babylon. Babylon was a beast nation also, that ant and was also anti-Israel. <laughs> Babylon was anti-Israel. It destroyed Israel. Babylon was a beast nation that was anti-Israel, and God's counsel was to pray for it, the intent being seeking that beast nation's peace. Why would God want peace for Babylon? Because God's people lived there. <laughs> In the peace of that nation, you'll have peace. 
idiot? <laughs> you know, what are you thinking? It's not that hard to figure out. But sometimes you can get so vertical that you get inverted and you're like, well, I don't know about seeking Babylon's peace, God. That's a, that's a wicked nation. Don't you know how much sin Babylon is responsible for, God? I don't know about that Jeremiah and his preaching. He sounds like a little bit like a sellout. He sounds like he's a, a traitor to his heavenly country, and he's, not, he's being mindful of, his, uh, of, the, of the things of earth and not of the things of heaven. No, that was counsel from God. Pray for, pray for that beast nation. All right? God, uh, and God even, how about this, God even set some of his people in places of power who used their influence to help maintain the peace of that beast nation. Now again, I'm not advocating that a Christian focus all his energy and strength on the horizontal, but you are not out of balance for exercising proper responsibility and participation in the horizontal. Whatever proper uh, is going to be defined as. And in some countries, you have more responsibility in your government and in your country uh, than in other countries. Here in America, as citizens and the type of government we have, we bear a great deal of responsibility for the way our country turns out. All right? So, how about this? If a female, ooh, if a female Esther is running for office, I'll vote for her. <laughs> okay? Maybe Haman will steal my vote through lies and corruption in his Dominion voting machine. Be that as it may, Haman's irresponsibility in advancing evil doesn't relieve me of my responsibility to advance goodness in my community as a citizen. I'll vote for Esther even if the system is rigged against her. Because I would rather be on the side of attempting to advance rightness than sitting on my rear end doing nothing and thinking that I was spiritual for doing so. Did you get that? Listen, had Mordecai thought that way and figured that his witnessing of political corruption and subversion was not his problem, the story of Esther would have taken some different turns. Deliverance would have risen eventually. And God would have used somebody else. But listen, it was God's will to bring that deliverance at that time through those people, Mordecai and Esther. And it's a good thing that Mordecai wasn't too spiritual to get involved. Wouldn't you say? Wouldn't you say it's a good thing that Mordecai wasn't so devoted to the vertical that he eliminated the horizontal and thereby became inverted? Don't you think it's a good thing that Esther, when Mordecai approached Esther and said, hey, you know, you need to, you need to do this and that because this and that's going to happen. Aren't you glad that Esther wasn't so spiritual, so uh, solely devoted to the vertical that she said, Mordecai... You shouldn't be, you have no business being involved in the things of this government. Why would you want to advance the peace of a beast nation, Mordecai? Aren't you glad that Esther wasn't so devoted to the vertical that she eliminated the horizontal and ended up being an inverted character in the Bible? No. She realized her responsibilities in both realms, if you will. She was a good woman who was devoted to God, the God of the Jews, but she also recognized that she has a responsibility and God puts different people in different places at different times. And listen, she was, she just happened to be the person in the place at the time that needed to take a stand for something that was horizontal in nature. And she did it. And she was right for doing so. Now listen, I hope you're seeing from these lessons how beneficial this template is Without this template in mind, admittedly, it is very easy to get off balance and be so biblically and spiritually minded that you end up inverted in your thinking. Now, that doesn't happen because the Bible is bad or the Holy Spirit is bad or you just need to not be, don't, don't get too involved in the Bible, don't get too involved in Christianity. I'm not saying that. That's, that's not, it's not that you need to back away from the Holy Spirit or the Bible. It's not that. It's just that you have an enemy who is extremely subtle 
And if he can't pull, pull you into sin and wickedness, he will try to push you into the ditch of hyper-spirituality, which is not spirituality. It's just you thinking you're spiritual. You see? So I hope this, this uh, template helps you in your understanding of the Bible and in maintaining a balance in the things that pertain to your spiritual life, your spiritual heavenly life, and your physical earthly life. And we'll go ahead and wrap up there. And uh, I don't think my throat can take much more of this this morning. So I hope this lesson has been a blessing to you. And I hope you'll join me next week at the same time. God bless.